It's happening all around America. Maybe even in your own home. I'm moving back home. What? But I told you I was coming here today to move back home. What? They're here to stay. They're back. It looks like you need us again. They're all back. It's a f disaster. <laughs> determine the most logical course of action in this economy is to move back home. And because of the broad number of young people doing this, there's no longer the social stigma attached. Is she done? I can never tell when she's done. I want to watch Taken. I love it when Liam Neeson kicks the crap out of European guys. God, I hate them. Since you move back in, maybe we're spending too much time together. That's because we're broke. I wonder if that's related in any way at all to not having jobs. <laughs> Martina and I used to have a good thing going, and now the girls are home. It's not happening at all. You gotta spice things up. How do you propose I do that? I got some tips from movies. Don't freeze on that image. What are you doing? I was putting the computer to sleep. Right here. Right now. I'm talking about sex, if that was unclear. But we're in session. Why are you suddenly interested in hipper, younger flavors? Maybe vanilla's getting a little old for me. But it goes to the gym all the time! You are a pain in the ass, mate. You are a son of a bitch, Dad. Look at us getting all mushy. Gun to your head. What's the most important thing to you right now? Getting the gun away from my head. I don't want to be a burden to you. You're already a burden to me. Look at this. Passed out drunk. It's all because of your permissive... Wait, stop me if she's actually dead. This is Jessica. Just because I slept with a girl doesn't mean I'm a lesbian. Doesn't it, though? You upstairs. Yes, sir. You two, get a room. We've got a room. You get a house. Wow. Thank you. Patrick Warbury. Thank you for coming out this morning. Thank you for being here with us. Patrick, thanks so much for being here. My pleasure. Congratulations on the new show. How did the, how did this show come about? You know, uh, sort of script got, got sent my way, and um, it was very relatable. I got it. Why? Why is that? Why well, I, I live this life. I <laughs> I told uh, the network, I go, I think it's adorable. You want to call your show crowded? It's not really crowded compared to my life, but uh, what, yeah, we'll go with that. What is your, what is your life com compared to crowded? Well, we got four at home. Two, uh, the two older ones both go to college and uh, live at home, and we have four dogs, and we have a bird-eating tarantula, and we have giant centipedes from Africa. Wait, what? And, yep. Yeah, giant centipedes from Africa, and my in-laws live with us all of last year, and my father-in-law was in hospice care while... Um, and my wife was his primary caregiver. And there's a boyfriend and a girlfriend that lived at our house. Not mine. Let's be clear. You got the wife, you got the boyfriend, the girlfriend. That's the I've got the wife and the boyfriend and the girlfriend. We're very modern. Right. Uh, can we go back to, the, to these centipedes? How did, yeah. those, how did those end up in the house? The $200 a piece, too. Can you imagine that? $200 a piece for bugs. My, my son's always been very into... You know, he's collecting bees, you know. You know by, by the time he was 10 years old, he was... a he had beehives, and then he was making mead, which is honey wine, and braggot, which is old world honey beer by the time he was 19. And I said I wanted to learn how to make moonshine, and he taught me how to make moonshine. So I got an underage bootlegger, which is probably, <laughs> it's probably legal in California now. So if we were in Oregon, I know it'd be legal, but California probably. Now, it seems that uh, with Crowded, the, the parents are sort of, the, the laughs come from their uh, disenchantment with the return of their family members. For you, it sounds like you, do you enjoy a crowded house personally? Is, are, you, are you more happy to keep the, keep the children around? I do. I love it. I totally dig it. And, and we, we, we encourage them to stay there, really. Is, I, I just think it's, it's the boomerang generation. That's what this new, you know, and young people, I guess, it's because of the economy or whatnot. I feel like it, it just makes sense because if you're going to go out and get a menial job just to pay rent, you're not going anywhere. And if you can come back and stay with your folks and get, get ahead you know, and work on what you need to be working on, it's better that way than 
just being out there and struggling to just sort of survive. So it's an easier way to pursue. I mean, for lack of a better term, pursue dream, pursue, pursue your dreams. You know, there's yeah. a bit of a safety net there to work on yeah. something that might not pay. Absolutely, and this is a different generation where parents and their kids were friends and parents. My parents always told me, "We're not your friends. Yeah. We're your parents." I'm like, "Yeah, you're not my friends." <laughs> Put that belt away, Jesus Christ. Um, uh, my parents are very good. I, I love my parents, but but, <laughs> Let's get but that I mean, <laughs> there were times I was just terrified, you know. Uh, yeah, you know, we got whipped. Um, <laughs> um, so uh, if you don't beat your children, then they stay. They'll stay forever. But we love have, having them around, and um, um, and it's just a good life. I'm totally regressing. I have a garage band now. I decided at the age of 50, at the age of 50, I wanted to sing and have a garage band. I never, and um, you know, uh, we're the Bearded Pearl Clams. We're a Pearl Jam cover band. You heard that correctly, the Bearded Pearl Clams. Uh, people laugh. I don't know if there's a, like a, some dirty connotation, but see, clams in music means hitting a bad note. And it's a play on Pearl Jam, so. You have dirty minds. Do you, do, you, do, you, do you wear a beard when you perform live? Do not. Okay. <laughs> I know it's the cool thing to have a beard now, but <laughs> mine is mostly white, so I don't have one now. Can you talk about the casting of, uh, of Crowded, how you guys got all these uh, great faces involved? I don't know how they did it, but, you know, everybody's so much fun to work with, and when I was told Stacy Keach was playing dad, I was... Unbelievable. Told, yeah. So we get to butt heads and have fun. Carrie Preston's amazing. The two girls are the two loveliest, most beautiful, talented lasses and good people on TV. And you can't miss, I mean, both of the, Mia and Miranda are amazing. And Carlise is great. It's a great cast. Do you ever get nervous working with someone like Stacey, Stacey Keach? You know, you've spent a lot of your time in, in, in sitcom and in yeah. comedy. And while Stacey Keach has done his fair share of sitcom comedy, he's also a legendary theater actor and, and, and film uh, actor, you know, he's been nominated for Academy Awards yeah. and stuff like that. When you show up to do a sort of co comedic sitcom and Stacy Keach is there, what's going through your head? Well, first I pull Stacy aside and I say, I'd like to work with you on this a little bit. <laughs> this is what I would do, and I don't want to be a director. Now, Stacy's very comfortable to work with, and and uh, he brings so much to the table, but he is, a, you're right, he's a guy who can, uh, can do anything, and um, but he's uh, he's very very funny, and he's got a really you know sharp you know comedic instincts as well as his dramatic ones and across the board. But um, um, you know it's just like with working with Jim Burroughs, you know, or or anybody else who's got a real true legacy and brings a lot to the table. You actually feel more comfortable be just because you know you're in better hands and everything should work better. Absolutely. I mean, I feel like you have your own legacy as well, David Putty. Is a is a is a legacy character. Do you feel that way? Does everyone know what I'm talking about? David Putty from Seinfeld. I mean, come on. Well, thanks. You know, I did nine episodes. That was it. But it, the show's that's true. You only yeah. did nine. I mean, that's to me. I, I watched Seinfeld so much since I was a kid, and that's mind blowing to hear that you've only done nine episodes because it's such an iconic part of the show. Well, it's in perpetual syndication, and so you, you're under the impression that, you, you could be under the impression that you did more episodes than you did, and, um, but uh, it was such a great opportunity, and, uh, and, and I loved it. Yeah. I, I would argue that uh, if you only did nine episodes, that your episodes are in heavier syndication than most others. I feel like anytime I see the show in reruns at between seven and eight or 11 and midnight, it is a David Putty episode. Well, there are not as many episodes of Seinfeld as there would be of other iconic shows because Jerry would, you know, sort of pulled the plug prematurely. He was done. So if there are nine seasons and they only did four episodes in that first season, I think there's about 188 episodes somewhere uh, total of Seinfeld when there could have been a lot more. And there are more episodes of other iconic shows. So it's a relatively low number considering the, uh, the impact of that show. And um, yeah, so I've done, uh, I've done the math on it and with the <laughs> nine episodes and the 108, you pop up more and it, it looks like you did more than you did, but uh, yeah, that's how that, that all works. What was your uh, audition 
for that character like? Did you know did you know those guys or did you come in and like an agent brought you in and they heard your voice and were like, that's it? No, I did not know any anybody on the show, and I got to go in for Larry David and Jerry Jerry Seinfeld, and I went in to read for them. And I had just two weeks earlier, I'd been on the couch. I remember with uh, my wife watching the show, we watched it religiously, and I looked at her and I said, ah, why can't I get on a show like this? And then two weeks later, I had an audition, and um, I was very excited. And he was for it, the role was for the. Uh, for Jerry's mechanic, and it was just a one spot thing. And most of the guys that were all coming in, I remember, you know, had this sort of like Tony or Vinny look like a New York mechanic. You know, I thought I'm gonna have to try something different with this because this isn't me. And I just made him, uh, I made him uh, sort of challenged, lame, I guess, let's say, <laughs> a little bit. I just, uh, you know, lines were like, yeah, yeah, that's right, or I don't even do this too. Yeah, that's right. I don't even. <laughs> I don't even do the swirl or whatever. I just made them this big giant moron, and they loved them. And were they uh, laughing in the room with you? When they you were laughing in the room. room. Yeah. So I walked down. I thought well, that that went okay. I I might get to work with my heroes because they all were. And um, I mean, I always I I was always amazed by Michael Richards. You know, it, it, Kramer was he was bigger than a circus clown. You know, but so real you never question like the integrity or reality of this character you never f felt like you were watching an actor make choices you always felt like you were watching this truly insane clown <laughs> I, I remember very specifically when it comes to David Putty and I'll get off of it in a, in a, in a few but uh, the episode where you paint yourself up and you scare the uh, the priest you know they're the devils we're the devils at that point, had you realized that Larry and Jerry had sort of seen something in you and in the character and were sort of, you know, now at this point bringing you back a little bit more and giving you even more to do? You started becoming pretty essential to certain plots after, uh, after a certain point in your appearances. Yes, but that was during the sixth season, and I did, so I did two episodes, and I was already signed to another show. And so for the next two years, I couldn't do Seinfeld because uh, I was uh, contracted to another show. And that show, you know, got canceled, and then I crossed paths with Jerry, and he said, you want to come back on during the ninth season, which was great and very fortuitous for me. But That's amazing. And so I would imagine that Seinfeld set off a lot of opportunities for you at that point, the David Putty character. It did. But as, as you see, you know, stuff like this, you know, I was in danger of being typecast after nine episodes of a show, and um, so then you got to do something different, you know, and decided to try to make, some of the you know, later characters after that a, a little bit more uh, intellectually adept than, say, David Putty was. But, I mean, this, was, this is, I think, has been my greatest uh, opportunity so far to do something and really be sort of you know, more the, the cog in the center. That we'd be able to, in other shows I've been on, they've all been sequestered or this or that. It's great to be under one roof where I get to have a relationship with my dad, something I can very much relate to kids, my daughters, you know, and um, where, um, you know, it's a true ensemble cast, but I do get to, uh, I get to, I get to have different relationships, and. Uh, Does it feel like this is something uh, with Crowded, this is something that is, I don't want to use, I don't want to say easier to play, but you say, you keep saying it's very relatable, do you find that when you sit down and do it, it's just kind of effortless for you to sort of do a part like this? Well, y you know, to a degree, it feels like a, you know, a pair of old comfortable shoes, but you know, you want, um, the writing's good. Suzanne Martin created, I think, a, a, a really fine show that it's current and um, smartly written. She's got a great background. She was, you know, a writer on Frasier for years. She created Hot in Cleveland. And this is, you know, it is very relatable. So a lot of it's art imitating life and life imitating art. Now, I've been a diehard, you know, uh, um, Eddie Vedder's my muse and Pearl Jam fan for, you know, decades. And we've integrated that with, you know, uh, you know, uh, Mike, you know, um, he's, they live in Seattle, and, uh, and he's a, you know, chopper pilot, and he just happens to be, you know, um, one of those, like, hardcore Pearl Jam fans, you know. Are you guys going to try to get uh, a little Eddie Vedder cameo? Does he ever make sitcom cameos? I don't know if I've ever seen him do that. He hasn't yet, but he's never had an opportunity like this. <laughs> we will see. I'm going to be like, Eddie, I've been in enough of your shows. You should come. You think that will work? You kind of owe me. 
Is that no? I think that'll. But you're you're a big music fan. You uh you were telling me that you just raised uh, a lot of money for uh, St. Jude's, right? Uh, with a with a big concert that you put on. Well, we have a concert. It's a golf tournament. It's a three four day event. This is the sixth sixth year of it. But we are the number one event for St. Jude. We raised one point seven million dollars and we beat Trump. We meet. I beat. That's right. Hopefully. I beat that little fella, little Trump. Hopefully you're not the only one that gets to say that in the coming there you, years. Absolutely. There you go. Yeah, he went down hard. Trump, little fella. It's a friendly competition, look, but he did lose. Can you talk about putting that event on and, and who was there and who was, uh, who was working with you? Well, yeah, I mean, we have, um, uh, it's great. We, have, uh, we must have had eight or nine uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame artists get on our stage. We had a four and a half hour jam session. And so these are the guys, you know, John Elefante from Kansas, Mike Mills from R.E.M., Kim Carnes. We had uh, the Gin Blossoms, Wally Palmer from the Romantics, Skunk Baxter from Steely Dan, and uh, um, the Doobie Brothers, Don Felder, um, Alex Lifeson from Rush, Robbie Krieger from The Doors, Alice Cooper. They all jam, and it's just, and they all play. We have Six Wire, this amazing band from Nashville who backs everybody, and they know that they got the best band in the world backing them, and so the concert's unbelievable. It's like the greatest show in rock. It's four and a half hours long. How long have you been putting this show on? Uh, for uh, five years now. How did that start? Well, uh, my buddy Clark Rainey, who uh, I got to chair this event and has a lot of good connections, uh, brought in his buddy Andy Kerr, who produces a lot of these artists, and said, look, it's for St. Jude, come on out. So they all come on out, and, um, you know, it's, it really is just the most important, in many ways, hospital in the world when you think about what they do. They, you know, they raise, um, they're the ones who have developed the cures and therapies for um, children with catastrophic disease and, and pediatric cancer. And so they even have to make their own medicine because for big farm, it's not profitable. So they make their own medicine. They're non-proprietary. So when there's something going on in the world and they have a problem like uh, like a cluster of adrenal cancer, pediat pediatric adrenal cancer in Chile, they just go straight to St. Jude and say, can you give us answers? And they share whatever they know with the rest of the world. And since they opened their doors 50 years ago, the over, over, uh, overall um, cancer cure rates for children have gone from 20% to 80%, but with like leukemia from 4% to 96%. And it, it, it does cost them $2.2 .2 million a day to keep the doors of this hospital open. And 75% of it all is from private or from, you know, contributions. So sometimes we feel like, wow, well, yeah, we made almost $2 million, but that's a day. And, they, and you know, at St. Jude, they're like, this is our number one event. You don't know how important it is. It spreads awareness at the same time. And so we've seen other events born of our event. And um, that's been great. And... Uh, Everything and every little donation anybody can make to St. Jude is a big help, you know. Well, congratulations on, on, on the fundraiser that you put together. And beating Trump. It's a big deal. <laughs> Again, hopefully not just you can say that. Can say that. Uh, you've, been in the sitcom, you've been in the sitcom game for a, a little while. Now, when it comes to family sitcoms, they are for families. They're for families to watch at home in many ways. But it seems like with something like Crowded and a number of other family sitcoms that have come out, the family dynamic has changed. The issues that families are willing to deal with have changed. We've become a more modern world, a more, for lack of a better word, a, a liberal world, progressive world in, in many ways. And we see that in what would... Many be considered. Many would consider the most conservative programming, which is the family sitcom on a major network. How do you feel about that when you're doing a show like that? How does it feel to be able to see a family dynamic work in a more realistic, modern way? I think it's I think it's important, and it's it 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 makes a lot of sense to me. I grew up in an incredibly um, conservative family. My father was in the monastery for three months. My mother was schooled at the nuns. I have three younger sisters. We were allowed to watch Little House on the Prairie. That was the one TV show a week or The Wonderful World of Disney on Sunday nights, and that was it. We couldn't have MTV on our house. We couldn't have you know, any, any of that. And the rules were strict in our house, and, and I just turned into one of the you know, most rebellious asses you, you could have ever known. And I, 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 so I don't think it worked for us. We've kind of gone the other direction, you know? And I mean, we have gone the other direction, and, um, and that's what this is actually, you know, all about. So it and is very I think as you said, going in the other direction has fostered a more a closer connection with you and your children and more of a friendship rather than just a simple kind of like yeah. I am the stern protector and yeah. you know, that's that's all that there is to it.
Yeah, well, they're not running around, you know, hiding cigarettes and getting drunk and driving cars and sneaking around. And, you know, I, mean, I, I did a lot of stupid things. But I, when I got to a certain point, I got rebellious hard, you know, because um, I was so small. I weighed 95 pounds freshman year in high school. And uh, I was scared of everybody, and it was including uh, being, you know, my father was stern and, and intimidated by him. And then when I started growing, it was just like, you know, screw it all. I <laughs> went and bought a motorcycle, and, you know, and I was always running out and, and drinking with my buddies. And, uh, you know, just none of, my, none of my boys, none of my kids have ever felt the need to, re you know, rebel like that. They, in many ways, you know, take upon the... Uh, to this day, you know, the, the parenting position. Dad, you can't do that. You can't, <laughs> Dad, you can't say that. Um, but they're very sharp and they've done great. They're doing great. My son, my son Talon, you know, uh, just did a, you know, a semester at sea. He's getting his business degree. He's learning ja uh, Japanese. He does the bow staff. He's acting, doing voiceover work. He's, um, uh, like I said, he's, uh, you know, you know, uh, he's raised all all of these incredible, like, uh, bizarre creatures from all over the world, and he's the one who taught me how to make moonshine. And my my uh, my son Shane is 17 years old and flying airplanes. All right, we're flying we, we're flying together, so I'm I'm getting I've kind of turned into a 19 year old with the Garage Band and decided I want to fly airplanes. And <laughs> the sitcom schedule does give you uh, the opportunity to do a lot of fun things because the hours are short, you know. Um, what, I'm curious what you thought when you started seeing your son uh, gr gaining an interest in honeybees and, 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 and doing all these things that most, most sons uh, wouldn't do. What was your first thought? Like, all right, let's just nurture this and see where it goes. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, we had uh, just jars and jars and bottles of uh, honey every year. You know what color you don't wear by a beehive? Black. Really? Yes. Why? Because that is that that's the color of their natural enemies, like badgers, bears, anything that gets into a hive. So if you're walking by a beehive and you're wearing a black shirt or black jeans, you're more likely to get stung than if you're wearing a white or anything. <laughs> Isn't that fascinating? Come on. How here, often? Here, well, no, this is fascinating. Like a nature program. <laughs> how often? How often do you did you get stung with your uh, with with all the bees around the house? Just every now and then. Okay. It's no big deal. Never cried or anything. <laughs> yeah. I think we have some time for uh, audience questions. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Preferably about the bees? No, <laughs> no, no bee question. Uh, so what was some of your favorite Family Guy cutaway gags? Oh, cutaway gags? Jeez. I'm going to have to go back to this one. Work brain, work. Um, God, I can't think of... Um, does anything come to mind? Uh, do you want to? I don't have a. I, I can't think of a cutaway gag right now or a favorite cutaway gag. Yeah, that's really hard. Each episode is comprised of about twenty. <laughs> I, just, I don't watch TV. <laughs> he only watches Little House on the Prairie, guys. He told us to this day. <laughs> Next question. Hi, my name's Rachel. Um, you do a lot of voiceover work. Is there something that you feel more connected to, or that you love doing, out of all the voiceover works you've done between Family Guy to it? all the new shows that you're doing? Well, I, you know, I always have sort of kind of loved Gronk, you know. He's one of the first things I did. It's this big, sweet cook, the reticent henchman. And I kind of got to create that voice, you know, because they don't know, what a, they don't know what a character sounds like until they hear it at times. They can do their drawings and their storyboarding and this and that, but you got to go in and, you know, and... and uh, so just the nature of this guy, uh, he just sort of seemed like, well, he's a big bad guy, but he's, I don't think he sounds dark or, you know. And I just sort of came up with a, you know, the chef who talks to the squirrels. And <laughs> he's always a little bit perplexed, you know, and doesn't really want to hurt anybody. And uh, it was fun, you know, it was fun to, like, come up with that and have him like it. And then, you know, to do a Disney movie, because, I, like I said, I did grow up on Disney. And... Um, so, so Kronk's always been, you know, uh, sort of, uh, you know, close to the heart. That one, it's fun doing. Uh, it's fun doing Joe or Brock Sampson. That's a fun. Those are fun voices to do. Um, but uh, yeah, that that would be the one. Yeah. Next question. 
Hi, thanks for being here. Um, I love you in Family Guy, Ann and Ted, my favorite things ever. Um, so kind of going off of him, how do you relate the most to um, Joe? How do I relate the most to Joe? Really? Well, Joe, Joe seems to, for the most part, be almost like you know the moral compass in the show. You know, the one who's got it to go. He's he's you know he's got the most on his plate, yet he seems to be the one with uh, you know the most it, you know integrity. It's always fun to see Joe just seem to like lose it all or like take advantage of his you know cop position or do something really douchey uh, is funny. But uh, for the most part, yeah, Joe is is. Uh, you know, I think I'm probably the most upstanding moral figure on that. I'm, I've, I've always, I've gotten hell for doing The Family Guy from uh, my parents who think my soul's in peril for being on that show. And <laughs> sometimes I watch it and I think they're right. They absolutely are right. But uh, then again, you know, it's satire and I hate having to explain what satire is to mom and dad. Uh, There's a pedophile on that show. You know? Well... It's a cartoon and it's satire and I think kids get it that Herbert is really gross and you stay away from him. Let's let's talk about well I'm, I don't I don't want to bring it up I don't want to have I am a Catholic you know I was born and raised Catholic but I go you know I think this is important you know there's too much you know my mom's part of a group trying to get trying to get the Family Guy off the air this is a funny wait, thing wait you're, I've been wait, wait, wait your mother's trying to get Oh yes, she's she has to, been for years. That's one of her charities. She's trying to, she's trying to take money out of your pocket in many ways. <laughs> well, no, in more ways than one. Because what I have been doing is, you know, we help. Um, we we we've helped. Um, you know, give mom and dad some some uh, some cash here and there. And uh, I go, you know, mom, I give you, I'm giving you money, and then you're still making donations to your you know, your causes, like, you know, parents for quality TV, trying to get Family Guy off the air. You, you, you know I'm giving you Family Guy money, and then you take the Family Guy money, and you spend it to get Family Guy off the air. And I go, you, if you do not see the irony of this, but what are you going to do? you got to give it to him. Um, uh, my, father, my father called once and left a message on my phone, and he just said, uh, in, a, uh, in a future episode of Family Guy, God is sitting in a lazy boy chair next to a bottle of lotion getting ready to masturbate. I wish you would get off that show. <laughs> Click. And, and it, there's no, it's like, it's, he's like devastated. He sounds like he's on the verge of tears. It's like, it, and I always say, Dad, that's not God. It's a, it's a cartoon picture of a guy with a beard. God does not give a crap about this. He really doesn't. It's just, he's got a sense of humor. He made you, Dad. What's the, what's the process like for recording Family Guy? The show has been on for so long, and it seems like everybody that is involved in it can do lots of other shows at the same time and lots of other projects and are never really maybe in the same place at the same time. So what's it like recording uh, all the VO for, for Family Guy? Well, it's quick and easy. You go in and you usually do it by yourself. But you never know who you're going to bump into who's coming in or going out, you know, because they bring in a lot of fun, you know, guests every now and then. Um, it's always fun to to bump into uh, you know Adam West. He comes in there a lot, and I've known him for for years. And he's still sharp as a tack, and uh, really a uh, really neat fella. But um, you uh, yeah, you're in and out. It doesn't take long. I haven't seen Seth in ages. He's just become too big and important for everybody. <laughs> Next question. Hey Patrick, thanks for being here. So based on the trailer, it looks like your character Mike is uh, kind of clueless in some departments, maybe the romance department, or trying to revamp. So based on that, based on your uh, playing the character Putty, he seems to be very successful with Elaine uh, when he's like ignoring her. He has his own method. So do you think he could give Mike any advice? And second question, what's your favorite Pearl Jam song? Ah, well, let's see. God, I've got a number of... In regards to Pearl Jam... So a buddy of mine told me, it was saying the other day, he just loved Jeremy. He goes, that's a great song. Probably doesn't make my top 50 Pearl Jam songs. You know? Yeah, because there's just, there's so many, I mean, from, you know, uh, you know a, a, a debut album uh, like uh, Black and Release and Porch and, you know, to, um, you know, uh, like Inside Job, which McCready wrote, you know, years ago. Or um, I love um, Release. 
the audience said that. Uh, Eddie's solo efforts, you know, the Into the Wild stuff, or even his, um, you know, ukulele album. I mean, you know, anything that Vetter, Vetter touches is uh, just amazing to me. But, um, and then, um, all right, so back to this. What could Putty teach Mike? Let's see. I don't know. I mean, look, Mike really isn't, I think, that, that inept in the, in, in the realm of that. I don't think we're going to make him look like a buffoon here, but I think he's, he, at some point or another, he does end up making a, an effort or so. You know, he's, I think what, you know, you know young ladies, you know, you know perplex him. And, 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 you know, and everything, Instagram and Snapchat and all that and all the BS that, that, that they deal with, um, I think it just all seems ridiculous to him. And um, so as much as he doesn't want to be like his father, and, and in certain ways, I guess he just, you know, he, he, he may be. Um, you know, he's progressive in some ways, but in, you know, in others still, you know, it just kind of, that's his default. But... Um, well, Patrick, uh, when can people see the show? Well, it's on pre, uh, pre it's tonight. Mm -hmm. Relay Well, it's tonight, two episodes after The Voice, but our regular uh, spot is going to be 9.30 p.m. on Sunday nights. Well, check out the premiere tonight, guys, right after The Voice, crowded on NBC. Up. Patrick, thanks so much for well, being here. Thank you. 